So, okay, everybody's here. Let me share, uh, first of all, screen to show this email I sent out earlier to see if everybody got it. So here's what I propose for a schedule for the coming weeks. I know I know a couple of people have conferences, so we'll, we'll take that into account when we come to that bridge. But um, so today we're talking about Middle Ponte and uh, just focus on that, maybe have some time to discuss examples. And next week in person, uh, I'm thinking we, we're we making good time with our different topics. So I'm thinking of maybe um, fitting in the discussion to relate some of this, not everything, some of this to, to contemporary um, technology issues having to do with um, like um, virtual reality, augmented reality, stuff like that, and see if we have now enough concepts and vocabularies to uh, distinguish between different kinds of um, mediated experience or even comparing mediated experience like going through the screen, looking at screens or looking through screens um, versus uh, looking at a, at a large screen like a film, you know, cinematic experience versus, um, versus embodied, you know, uh, so-called live experience, what's called live experience. So especially after today, hopefully we have some more ways to, to distinguish that and think about it. And like I said in my email, I'm also thinking of, uh, of uh, seeing if we have some notions and understandings that we can bring with us to, to when, we, when we encounter um, arguments uh, or methods that depend on neuroscience, looking at brain science, what's called, you know, like, like looking at um, cognitive science, brain science, neuroscience, these kinds of domains, okay. I think uh, Rachel or somebody put up this article from, <coughs> from Ian about Merleau-Ponty. Was it Morgan or Rachel? One of you. Thanks. So that's an interesting article uh, talking about, uh, relating, I guess you would talk about it, uh, relating, uh, in fact, uh, these kind of notions of embodiment to see what that has to say or imp what does that imply for um, the kind of technologies we use. So that's next week applications of sorts. And then on the 29th, uh, yeah, 29th is Alex, right? So, um, and that will be discussion about tools and crafts, you know, bringing it back to looking at you know, more like, uh, well, yes, hand tools and uh, manual be used tools, but I think we can, we can extend that, okay? question, it has to do with question about automation um, and the um, extension of gesture, you know, what kind of, what does that mean? And then there's spring break, um, right, spring break. Unfortunately for us, spring break uh, would be when we normally meet uh, in live. So I propose to make up for that by um, coming in person two weeks in a row that we meet in person two weeks in a row. What that means would be we would meet in person on March 14 and 21. Okay. So, so there'll be a bit of a compensation for that. I know, I think a couple of you have a conference to go to, right? For, what is it? Is it March 21? Uh, yes. That okay. day, uh, Lou and I will be coming back from IEEE VR. Okay, so maybe what we can do is uh, look at the topics for that week and then, you know, see if we can pad around it, basically, all right, so that you guys don't miss everything. Okay. All right, uh, any, any questions about this, uh, just looking ahead at this calendar? You'll notice that we have fewer topics than weeks, right? So that means we can actually take a bit more time and also uh, think ahead about the kinds of um, final projects that you would like to do, okay? And hopefully there's a chance to um, relate some of this to, give you a chance to write something that's pertinent to your own research interest, okay? And I have a question actually on that note. 
I was looking at the syllabus when you sent out the schedule and I'm pulling it back up now. It said something at the bottom about after the paper, it said alternate alternative meal exam. All of that. What, what does that mean? <laughs> well, you know, uh, I would love to do that. Uh, just that it requires doing things in person. Um, uh, so what I used to do in some courses uh, was really fun. I don't think I've tried it here. Huh? Yeah, I don't think I've ever tried it at ASU. Um, it was for a midterm exam, actually. And it was, I'm glad you asked. Uh, when we when we're reading about representations and different kinds of representation, like, you know, with um, with the narrative forms or with equations or with video, or whatever, um, then the midterm meal, and Wittgenstein too, um, talking about the limits of representation, uh, the midterm exam was in the form of uh, people breaking themselves into teams of two. Each team would come up with a recipe for something that people can eat or drink, has to be real, really drinkable or eatable. Um, then they would write the recipe or make the recipe, uh, write it up in any format. So it could be in the form of, um, you know, like a like a diagram or figure. It could be in the form of, um, of uh, you know, a, a series of chess moves, for, for example. Or it could be in the form of a, some some people made a uh, made a wine bottle. So the recipe was actually the wine bottle, but the way it was shaped and the way the labels printed up gave basically the instructions on what to do. Um, each team would bring their recipe uh, and in whatever modality, like sound, video, whatever, and they would bring also the ingredients. Obviously, it had to be something doable, you know, simple. I would host that in my place, with the kitchen, or somebody would host it in their place with the kitchen, and it would be chaos for about two hours. <laughs> and because what would you, you would do is you give your recipe and your ingredients to another team, the exchange. So you try to execute somebody else's recipe. And after chaos for two hours, we all sit down, and we have a meal. And it, it's miraculous how every single year, it's always turned out to be something totally fun and coherent at the end of the chaos with no prior planning, like who brings what kind of food now. And sometimes it was pretty, there were very strange recipes because this is always in an art context. So sounds like fun, huh? <laughs> I think that sounds awesome. Yeah, I never done it as a final. So I, I don't know, I just put it there as a teaser. I don't know how we could actually do it, how we could do it because, you know, it's kind of hard. You know, first of all, it wouldn't be fair to Tanya. <laughs> I mean, you could try something remotely. That would be a cool. <laughs> think about it as a as a conceptual exercise. I mean, if, you, if somebody comes up with a way to do it, I mean, you know, I, I'm all ears. This invisible cities is beautiful. It's, it's like in the in the conversation between Marco Polo and Kublai Khan, it's like they're describing cities by just a series of chess moves. That's like a common <laughs> mode. Um, it's beautiful. It's such a beautiful book. It's, it's so beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. beautiful. Really beautiful. Beautiful. Post a link to it. Uh, to, uh, it's really beautiful, Calvino uh, in general. Oh yeah, there's a there's a free PDF. I can... Yeah, yeah. Post the link. It would be great in the in the pattern. That's really nice. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, any other questions about logistics type of things? Yeah, we should. All right. Uh, so basically, after today, uh, we'll start with today with a um, little kickoff, an uh, intro uh, by uh, Morgan and Rachel about Melo Ponti. And, um, and that would be great. And then we'll dive right in. Um, there aren't too many pages, but they're, it's chock, they're chock full of examples. So can't wait to get into that. So the uh, baton is yours. Who wants to go first? Rachel, Morgan? I can Rachel. see. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, I think that makes yeah. more sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it makes sense. Um, so I'm going to talk more about um, him as a person. And then Morgan's going to start tying it into the readings and kind of kick off the discussion. Um, and, and I'll say most of my information came from three sources, the two links that I posted on the Padlet, and then also the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Um, there's obviously a lot more on him than what I'm including here. So I apologize if I missed something someone's really interested in. Um, 
basic biographical information. Merleau-Ponty was born in 1908 in Rochefort, France, and um, he died in 1961 in Paris. So, um, I mean, he died kind of young. He was not just a philosopher. He was also a psychologist, which I thought was interesting after James. That sounds like it must be a common um, overlap, which makes sense. But um, James was also both. Um, he was also an educator. So he served like formal roles as a professor. Um, he was also interested in anthropology, language, and the arts. And I think that translates to a lot of the, the work he did in philosophy as well. Um, and I'm going to apologize in advance because I'm going to say some other names and I'm not good at pronouncing names, but he also started a political journal. Um, so he was philosophical and political with, I should know this because I know he's famous, Sartre, Sartre okay, and Beauvoir. Um, they had a political journal called Les Tempes Modernes. Never took French. Sorry, guys. Um Personally, um, it sounds like he was a pretty likable guy from everyone who met him. He got along with everyone. Um, he really tried to look at things from all sides. And in terms of interrelations, he was very interested in things like nonverbal communication, eye contact, um, which shows in some of what we read for class as well. Um, and supposedly he was a very good dancer. <laughs> In terms of his impact and like the focus of his work, he really led post-war France in ideals of phenomenology and existentialism. Um, so obviously post-war is just, you know, an interesting time frame to be philosophizing. Um, he was um, interested in, or I guess his work kind of aligned with Husser, I cannot, H-U-S-S-E-R-L. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you pronounce Husserl. that? Husserl. 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 Mm -hmm. um, who was kind of the, the father of phenomenology, um, but they did overlap in years. Um, so what he really wanted to do in phenomenology was understand the outside world as experienced by humans. Um, and he was really big into the concept of a lived reality. And he talks about the lived body, lived reality, um, and one of the, the sources I read talked about it in the sense that, um, he found it important to describe lived experiences before you try to explain them. Um, he was also, um, a part of a, this is a quote, loose tradition of philosophers who have elevated the body beyond its ignoble place in Plato, <laughs> um, so um, he kind of took that farther than most and really placed the body at the heart of a lot of his philosophies. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll come back a little bit more to the embodiment side of things, but um, I also want took note that um, his later writing became more critical of phenomenology, um, but in the sense of wanting to reform it, not rejecting it altogether. Um, and his ideals were distanced by following philosophers, post-structuralist philosophers like Deleuze, who we will, I think we're reading Deleuze later this class. So um, I took note of that. Um, and then in terms of embodiment, um, he was big on that our, our bodies are what do perception. Um, so we're our, we are inseparable from our bodies. Our bodies are what open us up to the world. Um, they're not just something that we interact with, but they're a part of us. And in terms of the connection to our minds, it's not just something that our minds live in, but act, our bodies actively shape our perceptions. Um, he said that we quote, do perception. Um, so it, there's no clear linear path or arrows of this happens, then this happens, um, but it's mutual reinforcement. Uh, let me see. He also, 
I, I, I didn't see this as much in our readings, um, but he started to kind of hint at it. So maybe this is a bigger focus of later works, but that um, embodiment and perception is also central to our understanding of relationships. And then he took that a step further. This is again from another source, um, but one of the articles saying that he then applied that to the idea of the biosphere, which I didn't fully understand what the article was getting at with that, but I thought it was very interesting and something worth maybe exploring more at some point. Um, and then I did pull a quote. Is it okay if I read a quote from one of the articles? Of course. No. <laughs> um, Merleau-Ponty's insights started from the simple idea that we don't so much have as inhabit our bodies, living with them and through them in a complex social world. To make this clear, he distinguished between two notions of the body. There's the objective body that like other physical objects has a particular size, weight, buoyancy, and so on. It's what you assess when you weigh yourself on the scales, say, or when you pose for a selfie. But far more important is what he calls the lived body, the body through which we touch and feel and move. And this latter notion, he wrote, grounds us as being body subjects before all else. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, Excellent. with that, I'll hand it over to Morgan. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm just sent a link uh, to a Padlet post that I published right before class. Um, and that kind of has a summary of everything. Um, so in our assignment, um, we were tasked with choosing one particular section to kind of do an overarching review, but not necessarily a full analysis on, on what he's saying. So I was most drawn to the introduction, honestly. Um, so that's what I decided to choose. So that was pages 69 through 74. Um, and on the Padlet post, um, they had this feature to use AI to create an image. So I typed in expressive oil painting of multiple points of view and perspectives. And that's what it came up with. So I thought I would just add that in there. I thought it was cool. Um, I tried to do like the house example. I tried to explain that, but it didn't understand um, that at all. So <laughs> I opted not to. Um, so essentially, I'll start off with uh, with the first section within the introduction, um, and that is kind of this whole theory of the thesis and the antithesis. He doesn't say that explicitly, um, but it's kind of how I interpreted it. Um, so the exact quote that I have here is, more precisely, the inner horizon of an object cannot become an object without the surrounding objects becoming an horizon. And so vision is a two-sided act. Um, and, and in this, he also brings up this object horizon structure, um, which I think we should really um, go into depth in conversation today. And then concealing versus un veiling and how those are two very interconnected concepts that every object and everything that is perceived has to and can experience. Um, and then the next section um, of conversation that I thought was pretty notable um, was spatial and temporal perspective. The quote that I really was drawn to was, each present Def definitively establishes a point of time that solicits the recognition of all others. Thus, the object is seen from all times just as it is seen from all places and by the same means, namely the horizon structure. Um, so this the concept of, of the time and place of perceiving something and they were talking about, you know, the house of how you can see something today, you can see the house today and, you know, if it burns down overnight, it's still true that you saw the house that day. So I I think we should go into that in our, in our conversation today. Um, and then every perception is a perception of something. I was like, well, yeah, obviously, <laughs> but I'm sure that has a deeper meaning that we will uncover in, in this class session. And then the last section was um, the body as a site of experience. Um, I consider my body, which is my point of view upon the world as one of the objects of that world. And then he goes on to discuss the notion of the universe versus the notion of the world, um, objectiveness, intercommunication with the body versus communication with the body 
body in the rest of the world. So that's also kind of, you know, the interconnectedness that can be tied to my first point of conversation. Um, but yeah, so those were three main things that within the selected section that um, I think were pretty, pretty cool. Great, great. That's, that's fantastic introductions. Thank you so much, really. You want to just pick up from, um, oh, first of all, does anybody have questions for, for uh, Rachel or Morgan? No? Um, hmm. I'll just say it from the perspective of the person who read about him before reading. Um, it was actually really interesting. It was helpful for me, and it makes me think I should do this for all, everyone that we read, to learn more about the author before reading his works because it yeah. not only gave me context but like by the end of learning about him I liked him as a person because he was described which is not true for every philosopher but um, <laughs> he seemed like he was a, per a good person who was like trying to make this information relatable and so I went into it with that mindset and I I found it helpful yeah, that's actually quite interesting I know like there are doctors who are misanthropic right you know things like that and there are philosophers who write about ethics who aren't very, <laughs> aren't very ethical, <laughs> but then there are also decent ones too. Yeah, it's true. Also, it's just interesting, you know, like where he drew his, his, um, you know, he drew his ideas also from how he lived, right? So actually they do more of that than they might admit. Yeah. Uh, well, it makes sense for phenomenology, right? For phenomenology, I am talking about lived experience. So you might as well start with your own lived, lived experience. Uh, why not? Uh, yeah, we could actually maybe pick up from right from Morgan's uh, uh, topics that, that you pointed out. You know, why not? I mean, there are things I think that a bunch of us found uh, remarked as we went on. Um, in fact, that was going to be my first question. The, the first point is I'm just curious what people think uh, Merleau Ponty meant by horizon, because that's something that I stumbled over myself. You know. That was my primary question was trying to understand that. I maybe highlighted it like 10 different times and <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> My understanding is is that it because the when he related it to like filmmaking, that's when the concept of the horizon really cleared up for me. It's just like all all of your peripheral vision and the thing that's in focus, you know. So like my room is in the horizon right now, but my computer is the subject and what I'm observing. Hey, <laughs> now there's a cat. <laughs> <laughs> now it's a cat. <laughs> um, well, in that case, there's horizon and there's also foreground, background. The cat gives us a nice different mm -hmm. set of things to think about. Mm -hmm. So so at first, you know, horizon, I, you think of horizon as a kind of straight line, you know, way off in the distance. But mm -hmm. it, if you're describing it this way, Morgan's describing it that way, then it's what? It's a boundary, right? Between what and what? It's a boundary be between what and what? If it's a, If it's a horizon in that sense. Yeah. Like, object and non-object a screen has no horizon for, for example what does it mean by a screen has no horizons what do you think i'm not quite sure you know oh i i feel like i know that actually made a little more sense so so when i am working on screens and doing things on screens and trying to understand things on screens i have this feeling of this kind of like smooth infinite space that has no boundaries to it and mm -hmm. i find it a little overwhelming and hard to figure out what's focused on versus um it's part of why i still i think personally rely a lot on physical structures like note cards and writing on paper mm -hmm. because that has a diff everything has a certain presence that 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 holds my attention mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. um through this physical interaction. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that on any kind of screen that I'm trying to interact with. Yeah. Unless we do a trick. If we do a trick like, you know, <clears throat> like uh, fog out the background or whatever, then we're doing this kind of foveal stuff, you know, making some part of it. But that's kind of a very crude approximation of, um, what do you say here? Um, envision, however, I apply my gaze <clears throat> to a fragment of the landscape which becomes animated and displayed, while the other objects recede into the margins and become dormant 
but just a but, but they do not cease to be there, right? I guess with the camera, I mean, unless you're doing a trick, you know, in camera trick, uh, zoom doesn't change. I mean, everything's still with equally clear. Yeah, I think I found the horizon. The one place where I felt like I was starting to understand what he meant was when he was actually applying it to the temporal uh, aspect versus the spatial aspect of the horizon. So somehow that made more sense to me. This mm -hmm. like he called it the horizon structure when mm -hmm. he was talking about the present and the past. Mm -hmm. And somehow that made more sense to me because I, I can kind of conceive of time as this like focus window and we're moving the focus window right yeah. um yeah so what does he what does he mean by the inner horizon of an object yeah kind of the inner horizon of this is on page 70 that more precisely the inner horizon of an object cannot become an object without surrounding objects becoming an horizon and so vision is two-sided act i think Morgan or sorry Rachel or Morgan one of you guys read that yeah <clears throat> what is an inner horizon yeah that's a good <laughs> so let's see if I can change cameras while somebody's thinking of a verbal response I'm going to try to share uh, change of cameras just a second You are engaging in two-sided acts in a way. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I don't know if this is correct interpretation, but here's something. I'm wondering if, um, um, oops. Okay, so here's one object and then um, make it bigger. Okay, bigger version. Right, okay. Oh, it's tilted. That's better. Okay, so um, I'm wondering if um, we can have an internal versus an external approach to this object, right? Maybe I shouldn't have used a living being. It should have been like a box, okay, or a house. But then we can we can we can approach this. Well, first of all, horizon doesn't necessarily mean geometric boundary. Okay, to be fair, I mean horizon maybe could mean something like um, what's inside the. Um, foveal attention, you know, and what's not. Okay, so let's say that, but let's say for now we say, where does Xinwei end, you know? So we can look at it from the, we can approach, approach that from the internal point of view, or we can approach it from the external point of view. So there are two, I, I interpret it that way, that there are two horizons. You know, one is if you ask, where does this body end? We can ask it from the point of view of the body, of the object itself. Or we can ask it from the point of view of the complement to the body. So, so strictly speaking, there are two different entities. One's the limit as you approach from not body, and the other's limit as you approach from inside body toward not body. Right. So, um, anyway, that's just my simple way to approach that. Then we have to take away the, the diagram. You know, don't think of it so geometrically, but just my crutch. It's just a crutch. What do you think? You know, it's tricky because he's shifting all the time, right? Like uh, Tanya was pointing out, at some point he talks about what is it, horizon structure? In the case of a, of a temporal object, like a duration, and then when talking about film it's screens, it's talking about you know, it looks like the what's within view of a camera, um, and then he talks about other kinds of bodies. Then it's different, you know. But here he says, later on in that paragraph, he says, uh, the horizon then is what assures the identity of the object throughout the exploration. Uh, well, this is in the... Page 70, yeah. This is in the sense that uh, where he speaks of, like an object cannot exist in a kind of vacuum. Um, that it must kind of be in comparison with other, like it, the, the object is formed in re relationality. Yeah, I think uh, that was the word that came up in your introductions, uh, Rachel Morgan, relationality. 
And I think that's going to be really important throughout. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to time. Uh, Tanya mentioned object horizon structure. Uh, or is it object horizon structure? Perspective. Yeah. So what does this mean? The, the object horizon structure, that is perspective, doesn't hamper my desire to see the object. Um, it may be, although it may be the means that objects have of concealing themselves, it's also the means that they have of unveiling themselves. Which, uh, which page is this? All right, the bottom of page 70. So I'm wondering what this is. So here. Oh, that's not very good. Oops. This is the bottom of page 70. Anyway, right. uh, this does for a couple sentences. They're really, I mean, I was struggling with because it has so much like giving these objects like agency. Yeah. They're concealing or unveiling or showing themselves. And so I, I had a hard time getting over that to kind of be, you know, understand that as an analogy of some sort. Yeah, maybe we should pass over that and go to the following paragraph. Because sometimes it's easier to read on past it and then come back and pick it up again. I mean, that's what I think. So um, if I if we read to the next page, look at the next page. Uh, let's see. Maybe I should try just showing the document. Oh yeah, here it is. Right. Thank you. Look at the top of the of the. Yes. Right. Yeah, 71, top of 71. If we look at that, I'm going to try to share what I'm thinking about. Yeah, here. Okay. Um, in other words, <laughs> he helps us out. To see an object is to come to inhabit it and thereby grasp all things according to the sides, these other objects turn toward this object, right? So let's say there's a bunch of, um, well, in fact, it's easier just to show. <laughs> so I have this, uh, uh, so it takes so much switching. So here, okay, I have a bunch of objects here, whoops, on my tabletop. Okay, a bunch of objects. All right, so um, I'm, I'm, as I consider each object in turn, right, um, what I'm really doing is, is I can, or something it says, is that I'm projecting myself into this object, into this mouse. And then, but when I say I'm regarding this mouse, I'm also regarding it in relation to everything else around it. And that's what I think these other objects are presenting like this phone's present quote presenting itself to this mouse. Okay. So using, I mean, relation probably is what you would say, but relation is really vague. I and mean, relation is a very general term. So this is a more particular kind of relation that he's talking about. And, and yeah, he makes it more active. And it doesn't have to, you don't have to describe these things. You don't have to think of these things as living beings to still think that they have, they can present themselves in some way. Well, is it, isn't this having to do with his discussion about like we can only have one sided like momentary perception of an object and yet we are relating to the object as if it is seen from everywhere. And so thus it's he goes on later in that paragraph to describe so it's like when I see the lamp on the table I attribute it not merely the qualities that are visual from my location, but also those of the fireplace the walls etc that they see the back of the lamp, merely the face that it shows to, to the fireplace. And so like, it's, it's as if the other objects in, by putting them into the horizon are like creating this like multiple, like multiple dimensional view of the object of which I have in focus. Yeah. That part I didn't, 
fully under i mean i get the 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 idea of like this pencil i'm not kind of it is not in my perception as a like one or like sort of three-dimensional but mostly two-dimensional experience i have visually of it but i'm also kind of representing it in my mind as an entire object as if all the objects around me in this space were looking at it yes the thing is very delicate right because right yes to everything except maybe that phrase in my mind right which is the tricky thing right he's right. trying to get to the point where he's not he, saying you're trying, trying to avoid right yeah. that's really tough isn't it because yeah, we're trying yeah. to, <laughs> we're trying to be yeah, yeah i was like how do i explain this if that's in my mind right yeah, that, that's like remember last week we talked about james now we're trying to explain like he was james was saying remember we don't need the notion of consciousness as a substance right. but to deny that there are conscious acts you know mm -hmm. To conscious functions so like this thing like i hope this well it's not the best example because it's too messy but well it's okay like when i hold this i say it's a flower pot you know i know i, I know it's a flower pot i'm holding this flower pot and when i look when i regard this flower pot i know it's not just a well to the camera forget the least not just a trapezoid if you look at it from right right in front direct in front it's straight edge two diagonal edges and straight bottom trapezoid but if i go like this hey on a trapezoid but i don't need to do that i don't need to do this the camera optical um object recognition would need to have somebody do this to present all these other faces right but i'm just regarding the flower pot right away bang you know just to know there's a flower pot i already quote know all these other you know percepts and of course it's just a rhetorical i mean not just it's a uh, it's a learn it's um it's a um, learning device because we have to do this multi -perspective perspectivalism in all modalities time as well that's that's the part that's really cool and it actually goes this exercise of thinking perspectively as if it were a vision exercise we say oh wait a minute this goes for all modalities <laughs> you know so the the, the multi-perspectivalism is a product of it's a it's a it's a it's co-constructed, I want to say, between you as the observer and the and the and your situatedness in the in context. It's not something that is constructed in the mind or in the body. In that, case. yeah, I think I think like projection out and outward or. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think this is why people read Middle Ponty, this kind of Middle Ponty, to avoid having to rely on this thing called mind. Remember, I for that cartoon mind, of the, story, mind. Of the the what? Sorry, the distant mind. Sorry, uh, so that we don't have to rely on this um, invention of the mind uh, as an abstraction to which percepts appear. It's basically wow. part of. Uh, this homunculus argument. And you'll remember last week, I think I drew that di uh, cartoon on the board that there's this kind of brain and inside the brain, we have some mysterious little little man, you know, inside the brain that's receiving all the sense data. It's a version of the homunculus argument. I mean, it could be strong criticism of these kinds of um, theories of mind, um, theories that posit a mind. Uh, so there's that. Um, Yes, no, but but the, the thing that makes it even more radical is doesn't he say something about how? Okay, it's in the other part. Uh, how these objects present themselves to each other, mm -hmm. isn't it? Uh, yeah, right. Uh, somewhere here it says talks about that. Okay, all right. It's not just uh, imagining other Shinways looking at this flower pot, or even imagining other you know the other humans in the world. It is all perspectives. And that would make it really radical. That's a more than, quote, more than human approach to understanding perception. So this is, it's like, it's com like completely non-idealism, idealism. <laughs> That's <laughs> wanting to see. Well, the, the sentence of like, the, the house itself is not the house seen from nowhere, but rather the house seen from everywhere. So yeah. it's not like this abstracted or like this is the, this house that has some like yeah. essentialist characteristics 
and yet it is the house that is seen from ever i don't know if it so, well, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a good way to, to start this. I mean, like, if we say the house seen from nowhere, that would be an idealist position, yeah. right? And as if we could define house abstractly on its own without reference to how it's perceived at all, and without reference to how it's related to the rest of the world. Yeah, so that would be a really idealist way of thinking about a house. Yeah. So that's a really important sentence right there. Okay. Um, but in phenomenology in general, this is distinction between what your senses can tell you, which would be perspectival, you know, my hearing left, right, and things like that, or, or I, I feel what's in, uh, what's, I feel what this finger is touching, you know, versus, you know, whatever, you know, the other side that I'm not touching. Um, so I can feel, literally feel my way around an object if I'm blind, for example, or even if I'm not blind to get a sense. Those are all sense modal, sense, um, sensory modal, modal. Um, particular ways of feeling or sensing the world, and their perspectival. There's a quote of direction to it. But what's really interesting is how we we integrate all that, right? That's phenomenology. Um, that's how we integrate things. It, it was that's called the a, a perspectival intuition about things. So enough said about that. Perhaps uh, somebody wants to. Go that's it. Okay. <laughs> It's, uh, what's the other point I, 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 is, I think, let's go back to your Morgan's Padlet. Uh, yeah, that's the next one. What was it about? So what were we thinking about there? Um, with the... uh, let me reread it. Uh... Oh, the time and place. And that every perception is a perception of something. Yes, it's the second <laughs> bullet. Uh, yeah. I think. So, yes. Okay. So, what, uh, what do you think could be meant by that? <laughs> which page is this? Uh, is it on page seventy-one? Um, I don't think so. Hold on. No, let me read it. Uh, he talks about it in a few. Yeah. Speeches. One Seven of my three. favorite quotes that I made note of. Can I? Yeah, there, it's ahead. about time and space, but it's on page 141. Well, why don't you so, read it then? I was say I don't have to read it now. I can come back to it. But I, he says, I am not in time and in space, nor do I think space and time. Rather, I am of space and time. My right. body fits itself to them and embraces them. The yeah. scope of this hold measures the scope of my existence. Mm-hmm. Yes, I thought, no, I don't know if I totally understand what he meant by that, but I thought it was very poetic. <laughs> yes, me too. Exactly that. I, exactly like, that. Yeah, he, he uses this not in but of like distinction multiple times. And I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds super cool. And I'm like, wait, 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 what is that? Mean? <laughs> yeah. so I, I was um, kind of partially raised by a friend's um, grandmother who used to say, uh, tell us all the time. I mean, you know, one of us got a piercing or critical of a tattoo that we got or something. And she would say, get very upset and say, you're not of this earth. You're on this earth. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, so I find these things very funny because I, I just remember that all the time. Oh, you're not, you're not of this earth. And I disagree. That's what I very much disagree with that thought. And I let her know that, you know, I think I am. I think I am. <laughs> yes. What what did she mean by that? What did she mean by that? Um, it's it comes from her church going, you know, it's a it's a it's a very um it just means that you're special, you're sacred, you're from God, you're here, uh, and you're so you're not of this earth, you're not this okay material, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so that's your body awesome. is not yours. Yeah, it yeah. Belongs to God. Yes, yeah. yes. That is, it's interesting, isn't it? Now you have a sophisticated <laughs> response. Like, oh, that's part of the Judeo-Christian mythology, right? <laughs> and local centrism, blah blah blah. But it is interesting, right? That that's really great example because that would point out perhaps you know, um, uh, not not dependent on her, but dependent on a much larger history, on this idea of um, again idealist idea of the word of God. And having a, and God's mind holding 
you know, in an image of everything that there is. Mm -hmm. That's certainly an idealist position, or it became an idealist, idealist position. That's a great in, example. Great in, example. In your research on him, did any like religion come up or any? Mm. Not from what I saw. I didn't read the the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. We had a lot on him. I didn't read all of it. I'll do a quick search on that right now. Actually, I'm just curious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Tanya, yeah, comment. <laughs> it's a very important question, actually. Um, at least as far as I, I remember from this, what I read of this book, I haven't read all of it. I, I don't think he addresses religious questions or God. I don't think so. Maybe we can do a quick search. Um, uh, the oven, uh, oven on, okay, oven on. And in, the, the, the construction that, that uh, Cameron pointed out, it's a, that's a very, very, uh, very sharp uh, observation. I, I think, um, that gives us a chance to think about space time, all right? Um, how very, two, well, several very, very different ways to think about space time. But this thing about space time being absolute is fairly recent, right? I mean, recent, it's modern science from Newton, right? This idea of absolute space time, you know, X, Y, Z, and then you have these uh, axes that go out to infinity, and uh, we, we, um, we can, um, uh, as, uh, we can assign or measure a position to objects um, based on that geometry, but the geometry is abstract. And whether it's absolute or relativistic, meaning what, whether it's Newtonian or Einsteinian, it's still an abstraction that is independent of matter, right? It's independent of matter and independent of contingent occasions, like my birthday. But that's that's very different from thinking about like your body, right? Like um, um, making space. How does it make space? Well, let me ask you. Like, how, if I just said that, right? How how could you interpret what I just said? That your body makes space. You know, how would you how could you interpret that? Or even say, how would you interpret? You know, um, like this this pen makes space. How would you interpret that? What do you think? Okay, so I'm I'm gonna be full of other people telling me things today, but we used to have in our dance studio this board that we had this uh, one of my teachers put up this thing that says time doesn't move, we move through space and call it time. That's something that she put up, I'm sure it's probably a quote from someone else, and I don't remember that part. But what you just said made me think of that. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Let's hold that. Let's hold that and keep it in, in play. All right. That thought. Uh, for example, um, if if somebody, you know, it, like this, they, they can't they can't pass to each other, these two pens, right? And and I had the sense that um, I had the sense that um, you know it, it that my body, you know, I I can absorb things, I can eat something and drink something, right? But uh, then it becomes part of my body, right? Just this kind of sense of, 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 um, of, um, I got it. I kept trying to not say space, right? Uh, somewhere in here, he talks about um, position. Remember, talk about position Pos versus, yeah. Was it positional? Uh, positional um, That's uh, 102, positional spatiality and situational spatiality. Yes, versus situational spatiality. So this will come back. Um, so there can be this kind of, and, and it can be something like um, a fire too, right? A fire can, uh, what is, I always think the flames are fascinating, right? Because you think about it, what is the flame? Right, it's a region of combustion. Okay, it's a source of light. It is. What is it? You know, because it's not really. It's not a solid, right? Um, and and it doesn't kind of have a, a a definite shape, and yet it's there, sitting in front of you, right? Um, and it's super interesting because whatever you pass through the flame, 
is burned. You know, it's different from, you know, I can't pass this through me, this pen, right? So maybe there's something there about, you know, that's that we have different kinds. I have different kinds of impermeabilities here. And space, just space by itself, doesn't isn't adequate to to describe that. You know. Another thing is about time and duration. I think of going back to Tanya. Um, I'm wondering if uh, we can think about if we just use the word duration instead of time, it might help. In in the research that we've done at Synthesis Center, um, I've always proposed that we don't use the word time when we talk about rhythm. You can think about duration. The duration gives us a sense of chunk, right? Of, of some extent. Time is a bunch of instance geometric points, but then you say, wow, how can you have a bunch of uh, infinitesimal points add up to something, right? To a chunk of experience. Um, so duration already has this kind of extension to it, which helps us think, th think things through. Um, and then we can think about maybe, how about um, maybe making duration but how about having activity make duration, you know, right? So the sense of, right, like maybe if I don't move very much, we don't talk very much, et cetera, et cetera, then maybe uh, there's not much duration being produced. But suppose there's lots of hubbub, lots of activity, um, we get tired doing something, then you can think of maybe this kind of hubbub, it generates more duration in the same clock time, you know, maybe to the wall clock, it's five minutes either way, but some kinds of activities generate more duration, felt sense, maybe. Anyway, this is how I'm using some Merleau Ponty in our research, actually, to think about this kind of um, uh, notions of situational, let's say, temporality and spatiality, anyway. So that's one approach. Any, uh, how about some other uh, attempts to look at the same, this question about, what is this? Every perception is a perception of something. I don't know quite where that, uh, well, maybe we should look, look for that came from. Okay, I found something, it's on page 73. Hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll share the screen so that you can find it. Mm -hmm. It's Morgan, right, who found this? Yeah, that's the one I was talking about. Yeah. Well, I should back up a little bit. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, let's see. The house example. Actually, before we go there, uh, let's look at the house example. This is very nice. It's also poetic, right? We say we look at the house. I keep that you say if you look, if you stand in front of your house, okay, or wherever you are, you see just the front of it. The camera would only see the front of it, but you actually um, know all this other stuff, like the back of the house, which your eyes don't see, or in his case here, cracks growing secretly in the thickness of the ceilings and the pipes and the foundations. So, and remember James was talking about this kind of thing too. Remember he's talking about uh, like, what is it, Memorial Hall? That when you say, when you think Memorial Hall, you actually are, uh, um, well, regarding it in, well, you know, regarding it in all these senses that other minds can also regard, even if you don't, even if you don't see it. In his case, okay. And here we never see them, but we have, but it has them. So, so just okay. above that, in where you have it underlined in red, there it starts with thus the synthesis of horizons is but a presumptive synthesis. It only operates with the certainty and precision within the object's immediate surroundings. And that within the object's immediate surroundings, I don't know, that seemed important to me. I, it's like a focus, like how mm. much you can, the further away you get, the less 
you can know or see or perceive that object as a single as itself yeah as separate yeah, yeah. that that seems reasonable it doesn't i mean we don't have perfect mm -hmm. we don't have perfect perceptions and if we're focusing on something then we're not focusing the other parts of the world yeah okay so that's reasonable that's re now let's go down let's go down so we have the house example in mind Okay, hang on, hang on. let's go down here. Okay, the object, it fully spreads out. Its parts coexist while gaze skims over them. Its parts, this is more poetic. And here it starts depositing the object, takes us beyond the limits of our actual experience. And the it's not ecstasy in terms of mode, mood, it's a, a technical term, okay? The extas of this experience. This I don't know, okay? Um, You know, the key thing here is makes it such that right here, makes it such that, okay. So then it has this connotation, this we should look at the French if we really wanted to be rigorous about this. But um, the way I interpret this is that this is a construction. It constructs, okay. That means that if we say this, uh, every perception is a perception of something it's not necessarily the case that there is something already out there in some transcendental sense to be perceived. No, it's the other way. It's more like the summation of these perceptions then um, converges to the something. Okay, so that would make it easier to understand for me at least. And this fits. This fits with this idea of articulation or co-articulation. Right. The summative part in the earlier that we that the underlying part that Tanya pointed to, this the, the presumptive summit summation of presumption of perceptions. Okay. Let's zoom out a little bit, okay, for this whole seminar. Um part of the 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 methodological um takeaways that we might get that you know one might get from the seminar is instead of this kind of um an idealist positivist position that there are things out there with definite predicates and they're just even whether or not we exist there's just these things out there with definite predicates and all we need to do is go out and get the right technology to observe them okay um that's one approach right another approach would be to think about well how the, the instruments that we build to make observations and the techniques that we build and also, we build them together with the theories that we build to account for the observations that our instruments make. And the, the instruments that we make are made according to the theories. Okay, this is two parts of the triangle I'm going to build for you. Now, an example of that is, for example, the this, this, this scanning, scanning electron microscope. You know, because those microscopes are um, gigantic pieces of machinery. And the, the way they work actually is to detect, for example, little currents of, um, that are needed to keep a needle above a cer certain fixed distance above the atoms in the, in, the, in the plate, you know, in the thing that they're measuring. But the current that's needed, that's measured, is measured according to quantum mechanical theory. So you apply the theory in order to um read out uh get numbers out of the electrical currents that are being generated by the resistances okay by the analog resistances so you need the theory to construct the instrument the scan electron microscope then constructs these images of what we call atoms bumps right if i've seen those pictures right which then is a phenomenon we call those bumps atoms but in order to generate those pictures, 
we needed the instrument, which itself was designed according to theory. So you see the loop? Okay, <laughs> this is a very famous example that's done in history of science. I'm not telling it very well, but anyway, so the point is that there are three things going on, three, three things being co-constructed. The theories being constructed, the instruments, apparatuses and measurement being constructed and the phenomena is being articulated at the same time over history, over, over years and years of trial and error. And this triple, happens over and over and over again. Okay, this, this articulation of phenomenon, apparatus, and theory. This is a big takeaway. It's very helpful. What is that called? Is like, I'm sorry? Is there a word for, for that or like area? Uh, I don't know, Shiwei's little theory of history of science. <laughs> no, no, no. There's a lot of research on this, a lot of uh, writing about this. Um, uh, okay, look, uh, let me let me get some references for you. I'll, I'll post them. This is in history of science. History of science and history of science. Um, um, it, it's called, in fact, there's a term, there's a term for one part of it, which is the notion of the theory-laden instrument. Mm. Theory-laden instrument. But that's just, you know, part of the story. Another would be looking at Galileo, Galilei, the, the kind of like a, like a history of Galileo, Galilei. As in terms of early early astronomy, the history of early astronomy and how telescopes were invented and things like that. Yeah, that's really fascinating history. But it happens over and over again. So, okay, um, let's move on. Oh, you know what? It's uh, maybe time for a break. So I wanted to, with that, I, I was thinking maybe go to the, jump to the section on the pipe. Remember, uh, that's on page 102. <clears throat> The, the pipe, pike? Pipe, smoking a pipe. Oh. The example of hold, while holding a pipe in your hand. And before that, I think on page 102, also page 102. Let's take a look here. Yes, it's a, it's a next chapter on motricity. <clears throat> what kind of, I guess the capacity of being able to move. <laughs> Um, yeah, 102, this is after he talks about body schema, which is pretty abstract, but it gets more concrete on page 102. <clears throat> oh, um, if you want to, uh, I propose everybody, if you have a desk in front of you to do what I'm doing, which is to do what he said to do, to you know, if I stand in front of my desk and lean on it with both hands, that's what I'm doing right now. You know, if I stand in front of my desk and lean on it with both hands, <clears throat> only my hands are accentuated and my whole body, lean on it, we'll put some, put some uh, weight onto it, okay? And my whole body trails behind like a comet still. I am not unaware of the location of my shoulders or my waist. <clears throat> Rather, this awareness is enveloped in my awareness of my hands and my entire stance is read, so to speak, in how my hands lean upon the desk. So I can go like this and shift my weight, you know, take the weight all in one hand, right to left. And I'm doing this too fast. If you do it for yourself, all right, you will feel the meaning of this phrase that you would never get from reading the words. <laughs> okay. This is basic, you know. <laughs> and what's funny is that once I, I did this uh, experiment with some phenomenologists, they were reading, a re they were experts in Menlo Ponti. <laughs> and uh, we had this projection in my lab uh, onto the floor of uh, some video that's computer generated. And the way it worked is that you, you wave your hand in front of the camera and it will stir up the projected, you know, fluids. <clears throat> but you have to do it. You have to do it with your physical hand and then feel the, um, the um, how coupled it was, your hand to the motions of the particles. It really felt like you were stirring something, you know, because the motions were directly coupled to your to your fingers <clears throat> but you could just watch a lot of the work you did with synthesis of like the embodied movement um and that we were uh, or just like you're moving around in, in the space and then there's a reaction of the in the uh i guess three th three dimensional computing space yeah yeah, yeah. and you have to you have to do it you're, and that, that's why i built those lab you know because i can show you videos right but you won't feel the difference between um, 
walking around on the floor and just having a recording play out on the floor of these swirls. And they just swirl, do their thing. You could be sitting down and still be swirling around you. You might even get a sense of vertigo, okay? Yes, but you won't get this embodied sense of that your body is really swirling through something that's you know, flowing along with you. Mm -hmm. So, and I claim that even if you were walking around and around on the floor and maybe it was swirling, you still might not get a sense if you make a variation. Right? If you start to slow down a little bit and it doesn't slow down. All right. So this is what he's doing with his desk example. Then the pipe. Right. If I hold this in my hand, and you can do this yourself, in my closed hand, it says the position of my hand is not determined discursively by the angle it makes with my forearm. Like this. Um Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. In other words, not with geometry. Okay, I have an, He says I have an absolute knowledge of where my pipe is, and from this, I know where my hand is, and from this, I know where my body is. Wow. Um, and think about it. Like if, if I can go like this, I just pass it from one hand to the other, and you know the typical thing. You you touch your fingers behind your head, right? Just to be able to do that is actually quite interesting because that means you are able to have a what a proprioceptive sense of this world around you. Okay. And then he uses this word in another part of the text, interoceptive. Okay, this proprioception, we're gonna have this corporeal sense of the way different parts of the world around you is related to you, you know, corporeally through with respect to your body. Um, and an interoceptive, <clears throat> an analogous sense for the inner parts of your body. You know, uh, super interesting. It's more than just pain or pleasure, right? It's this kind of sense of, a, of, of um, attentions, for example, tensions in bulk, and mass. Makes sense, huh? Makes sense. Okay, so very part. It's very very nice and concrete. Um, we're going to work that out later on with respect to playing musical instruments, driving a car, you know, complex, complex skills. Um, I've been thinking a lot about what you're talking right now. I mean, for a while, for several weeks now, in terms of infants and when we were first talking about language, and I was thinking a lot about how you know, newborn babies, they have none of this and they can't even look at their arm and move their arm even when they want to. Um, and they have to practice. They, that's all it is. They just have to do it and do it more. <laughs> and it's the same as they develop language, right? There's some experimentation and you get a result and you do it more. <laughs> well, this is where his example of the, I forget the condition, but that neurological condition, that person was very interesting of like the person who couldn't like point to their nose or like point to the parts, like parts of their body, tell which part of their body was being touched, I think, but then could like slap a mosquito exactly where, yeah. Was, or I think or were a uh, was it some type of like fabric worker who could work almost as efficiently as a uh, kind of healthy fabric worker with the objects with the tools and then cut scissors yeah. and whatever right you know and then he was he, this was Merlo Ponti's way of describing the situatedness of action and it's like non-abstractness that like the movement in space isn't like a we don't have to think let me let me let me find them yes yeah, one one third section 133 or page 106 mm -hmm. why don't you why don't you read out what you're what you're thinking about well here is he says classical psychology does not have any concepts for expressing these varieties of the consciousness of location 
because for it, consciousness of location is always a positional consciousness, a representation, a Vorstellung, because as such, it gives us a representation, it, it gives us the location as a determination of the objective world. And because such a re representation uh, either is or is not. Yep. So that's the opposite side. <clears throat> um, and here on page 107, <clears throat> um, he's quote, he, he's uh, Merleau-Ponty is imagining as if the subject is, or the, the person is speaking. And then he writes, I ex quote, I experience movements as a result of the situation as a sequence of events themselves. My movements and I, we are, so to speak, merely a link in the unfolding of the whole. And I'm scarcely aware of any voluntary initiative. Everything works by itself. Um, <clears throat> so here I take it to be like, um, yeah, the, the, this distinction between abstraction and like understanding or like cognitive understanding of a of the object of the body as opposed to like an embodiment and a being of and in the body uh where it's not that the, the like where when we lean against the table it's that's the 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 sensation and the action are kind of are like the same thing sort of yes we're not we don't have and and then he uses also the typing or the organist example where it's like that there isn't an explicit or like abstract or representational way of describing what's going on. And yet there is a fluidity of the action. Um, yeah. Yes, they're all good examples. Like um, the word objective uses the word objective in many, many places as to describe the kind of, um, we'll say, uh, oh, don't say abstract, the kind of, um, a disembodied way of thinking about where things are and how my body is related to relating yeah. to the world. For example, in the case of uh, the typist, you know, he says, "Well, the type you when you touch type, <clears throat> you don't have to memorize the x y positions of the keys. You can't do that otherwise, actually, right?" And in the case of the um, of the pipe, it's not a matter of knowing the joint angles to get <laughs> to get to know where the pipe is. You just put the pipe yeah. in your mouth or not, you know. If you can't do it, there's something wrong, right? Um, what's in, another example? Um, the the organist. organist. Yeah, the organist, right? And that's one of the best examples, I think, in the whole chapter, where he talks about how an experienced organist who's already learned to, uh, to play organ expertly on some organ, right? Some several pipe organs, uh, goes to a new one. And every organ is different, right? In some ways, especially, you know, you know quite somewhat different and some quite different different number of pipes different registers you know some have two sometimes three banks of keys etc etc the pedals are different so it takes them an hour let's say to get used to it but only an hour right yeah whereas it might have taken you know 15 years to play organ to be an experienced organist it doesn't take 15 years to re relearn all those kind of very fine um mechanical muscular uh, techniques, mapping it from the physical stuff. But he also, that's uh, that's one. And the second point though, is it's not abstract. He's not uh, making a map and then doing yeah. geometric measurements either. He's not memorizing, he said, not memorizing. You know, okay. So that's not memorizing the objective data. You see, as, I'm re as you read this, you think about computers and robots, see? So if anybody's tried to program a robot, it's completely different. It's completely objective. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right? How do you speak to that? Uh, uh, and that's the only way. And that's part of what I want to talk about next time when we meet up, is this, uh, what Milo Ponti is talking about as objective uh, referencing of bodies, action, things like that. That's the only way we have to represent things digitally. Mm, yeah. Actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, you hit upon the, some of my favorite examples, um, the organist, the pipe. Oh, right, and also this amazing set of examples on page 106, I guess, with that, the patient, 106, 106. Yeah. 
All right, funny. He says here, <laughs> you ask him to point to his nose. And what is it? He succeeds only if he's allowed to grasp it. <laughs> but <laughs> it's really funny. I mean, you can't do this, right? Point your nose, but don't touch. Or what is it? Uh, right. Or if you do this, he can't do it. You can't touch your nose with this. You can't touch your nose with the finger. It's really amazing. Right, the movement becomes the movement becomes impossible. That's what's. I mean, it's not even like getting there. It's like can't even begin to get there. I find that amazing, amazing. Right. So, so grasping, uh, pointing to versus uh, touching. So there's pointing to, there's touching, as grasping, and they're different. Um, and he says here, right. It must thus be admitted that grasping, touching are different from pointing even for the body. <clears throat> and think about how this is different from psych research, right? a lot of psych research, right? We're looking for, remember the weird article we read, <clears throat> the weirdest people in the world? So think about this. I mean, it's like, instead of looking for similarities across classes of people, here in phenomenological research, it's different. It's looking for one case, just one, that illuminates subtle differences in how everybody actually processes things. All you need is one. <laughs> you know, very different way of doing a kind of science. It's quite interesting. I remember when I was a grad student talking to my computer science professor, um, advisor Terry Winograd, who's a big name in artificial intelligence, um, and he left it because of various things, including reading phenomenology. He, um, I told him I was interested in phenomenology and trying to understand blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, so you, wanna, you want to basically learn from examples of one. You want to be able to generalize from examples of one. <laughs> yeah. And this is an example. So what's another point? Somebody want to step in and draw attention to something? I have, a few I have more. A, another example um, that I thought was really interesting. I feel like I'm pulling more from the later part. For some reason, it resonated more with me. But mm -hmm. um, at the end of page 150 and on to page 151, um, it's it's just another example. Um, but that people, subjects, recognize their own don't recognize their own hand in a photograph or many subjects hesitate in recognizing their own handwriting mm -hmm. but that everyone recognizes their own silhouette or a filmed version of their own gait and i thought just in general throughout it all he did a really good job of using his psychology background as examples but that was one that um yeah that stood out to me that was really interesting have you found this? You know, but... uh, go ahead. Oh, ha I was just wondering: Has anyone tried on expensive jewelry, specifically rings? Is what I'm thinking of right now. So if you if you go to try on expensive jewelry, you know they'll they'll put it on, but they keep mirrors right there. I mean, you can look at your hand, right? But it's a really different experience to look at your hand with the ring on in the mirror. And I've actually, you know, there have been something I was looking at and. It, it just changes the way it looks. You can tell what someone, else, how it looks to someone else if that someone else was you, yeah. um, which is, I think, kind of in line with what Rachel was saying. Yep, yep. I'm trying to find, I don't think I can do it on the spot, but um, there's some beautiful work by um, a media artist, and I'm blanking on his name, which is a shame because it's one of the most important media artists. Um, he may, maybe somebody can help me uh, recu recuperate. It's um, <clears throat> he he took these videos of I think it was his father actually, and then as a really old man uh, hobbling across the street, and then he did he took a series of videos of other people walking across the street. But it was like grainy video. But then he even downsampled it, and he produced it on the five by five, just twenty five LEDs. You know, usual videos have what hundreds millions of pixels. Well. Hundred millions of pixels, right? So here was only five by five. So just five in a row by five rows, fat. 
um, LEDs. And so you can imagine just basically just blur, this bunch of blurs, right? Um, and then he put a wax paper, piece of wax paper in front of it and bang, you, you could see that there was a old man hobbling across the street because he was interested in kind of the minimal resolution you needed to get a sense of that person and gait was kind of the last thing to go or the first thing you, you begin to discern is the gait of that person. And you could tell at least that it was an old person. And then you could say, oh, maybe it's a old person with a cane. And then they, oh, maybe it's my father. You know, like, it's amazing. So he did a whole series of these really famous um, works of video art. Mm. I'll try to find the post. There, there's similar work where they uh, had like a, a, just a few sensors like on each limb. So maybe 10 sensors in total. And then they had people walk and then all you saw was just the movement of the sensors. And if, if you knew the person immediately, you could tell it was them. Isn't it amazing? Was, yeah. It's really wonderful amazing. actually. It's wonderful. Yeah. So, um, yeah. The thing about um, the, the objective uh, measures, I think it's uh, true for all sorts of, um, what sensors can pick up. So in our in our research, we try to make a distinction between uh, sensory and sensor. It's awkward English, but sensor would be the devices, electronic devices, and what they can measure. And sensor is what we feel touch here. Okay. Um, so let's keep going. The blind man's cane. Uh, I think, uh, I forget who it was, Cameron maybe talked about relation or maybe Morgan. So yes, absolutely. I think uh, relationality is shot throughout all this, but in a blind man's cane, remember this example is page, yeah. oh gosh, 144 maybe? Let's take a look here. 144. Yeah, me too, actually, Rachel. I think the later passages, parts of the chapter, it starts pulling it together. So the examples get richer and it's, it was easier for me to get into, I think, also. Uh, the main, main, main paragraph of 144. Thank you. Ah, yeah, the whole paragraph is great. Yeah. So in, the, in this is page 144 in the middle, main paragraph. Like, thank you, Cameron. Um, he talks about uh, driving a car and just, you, you know, any, anybody who's driven the car for a while, you know, you get a sense of where the car is, <laughs> you know, where the uh, where, where it begins. And it's really, it's really just, it, it's part of the somatic, somaticization uh, of the world. It's kind of muscle, it talks about muscle memory, what we, people call muscle memory, right? Whether it's athletics or musical instruments. How many of you play musical instrument, by the way? Any kind of musical instrument? Okay, yeah. Used to. Used to is fine. Okay, okay. so... All right, so so we know, I mean, those of you who've done this, right? Um, um, how, you know, at the beginning, you can't even know where to put your fingers and how to move them. But after a while, you know, you begin to be able to um, play what you intend. <laughs> so to play a scale and to play a melody, you know, you begin to, without thinking about how to articulate, you know, or where to put your fingers and things like that. Um, I used to be able to play. Oh. Go, go, please. Well, well, this is interesting because I've heard this argument as a what is unique about humans is our ability to extend our being into tools or like into objects that we are able to like the the essentially we're able to extend our embodiment into objects that we're interacting with, which is the case of the car or with the blind person's uh, stick. Uh, is that they they sort of become sensory organs to us. Uh, what do you make of that? I mean, I I I think we, we, human uh, animals are probably smarter than we think they are. But so I don't know about the like uniqueness of humans, but like the extension of being into tools is very much what what Marlo Ponti is is, is speaking about. Yeah. When we read, uh, I don't know if we're going to get this in the Thor Magnuson reading. I have to remember that. Um, but this is very interesting, the question, because it's going to be that week that we talk about tools and instruments. And I'm thinking musical instruments are great because they give this kind of, um, it includes this question of expression and expressivity. Um, so, um, but anyway, I'm thinking about um, 
this question of different points of view. Okay, they're all fine. But one point of view is to just recap what we're hearing here, this idea of extension of agency or the extension of, um, of uh, intention, let's say. Uh, and that would, that would still uh, locate you know, um, the intention in the subject, the human subject, um, the tool user or the bird or the monkey or whatever. And so it's like a prosthetic theory. You know, you know, people talk about prostheses in a conceptual sense as ways to extend the body of the subject in certain ways um, with the intention. Another way is I think this example that we have for the blind man's cane is, it's very interesting, right? You use tap, 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 and you, you could read it that way. You could read it as an extension of the, in fact, he talks about this, where is this here? The cane's furthest point is transformed into a sensitive zone. And it, I'm reading, okay. It increases the radius of the act of touching and has become analogous to a gaze. But in his case, gaze is actually a haptic sense, but we'll, we'll pass yeah. over that. Um, I'm looking further down here. Okay. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm looking down here. In the bottom of that page, after discussing how this is working out, how you habituate yourself to the cane by really tapping around, um, you can think about it this way. I think I mentioned this before. You can ask the question, where does the blind man end and where does the world begin in this setup? Okay, is it in the middle of the cane, the beginning or the tip? Well, you know, these are all artificial, right? So what's really interesting is how the cane uh, changes the mediation between man and world, blind man and world. So, and you can ask the same question, just feeling around with my fingers or even listening, right? The, the trained blind person will uh, mediate with the surround acoustically through hearing. So that's a mediation too. Um, and then it doesn't, you don't, we don't need to ask the question, where does one begin and where does the other, be, um, where does one end and where does the other begin? <clears throat> it's just different modes of mediation. It seems more fruitful. So that's where relationality comes in. Make sense? Yeah. But I do like the description here. You know, it's just like the, it's analogous to the organist, you know, uh, getting used to the organ. Give, give the blind person another cane, maybe a bit longer, a bit shorter, then they tap, 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 you know, and then begin to feel this is how I now, you know, now sense and navigate. It's really nice. Places, I'll read him. Okay, places in space are not defined as objective positions like you know, X, Y, Z, in relation to the objective position of our body, but rather they inscribe around us the variable reach of our intentions and our gestures. It's that last part, the intentions and gestures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that the, the next three sentences are really interesting. To habituate okay. oneself to a hat, an automobile, is to take up residence in them, or inversely, to make them participate within the voluminosity of one's own body. Habit expresses the power we have of dilating our, our being in the world, or of altering our existence through incorporating new instruments. The dilation of being <laughs> is that's an, uh, it's pretty strong language. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's why I wish, you know, sometimes we could look at the French too, because I, I just think they're pretty striking. It's pretty striking. Yeah. Language, dilating our being. Yeah. And whole question, this passage is here are talking about habit, right? And maybe we should back up here and let me, let's do a search on habit. That is a very important topic here. Habit, habit, habit. Let's go see. Let's start talking about habits. Habitual habitus. Habit 22. Uh, it, it starts, well, one, one place is page 143, section, a section that's called 
labeled a titled habit as a motor acquisition of a new signification. Um, and think about this, okay? He uses the word signification. Again, we'd have to be, you know, to be rigorous. We look at the French and see what was being translated. But remember, we're talking about signs and signifiers a couple of weeks back. And this idea that um, this famous, famous diagram, which is here, uh, we'll get better at this. Okay. Yeah, okay. So the famous diagram would be kind of a, a, a sign, a sign as being composed of sign, basic semiotics, being composed of two parts, the signifier, whoops, such as T-R-E-E -E and the signified. Well, I drew another signifier, but really what I'm thinking about is the actual physical tree down the street here in front of me, okay? Uh, so you can never actually solve this problem. Of, <laughs> this is still just a sign of a sign, a signifier of a sign. Uh, but in any case, um, this is a classical semiotic approach, so-called semiotic approach, right? To explain, to at least diagram, you know, there are signifiers and a signified. But here, we're very far from that, you know? Uh, because he's talking about motor acquisition, motor acquisition. That's really radically different, right? Uh, of a new signification. So it doesn't vector through squiggles, <clears throat> you know, uh, some representations anymore. And this is really the thing about Merleau-Ponty that people found very helpful. That we don't need to vector everything always through some representations like words or, or figures, numbers. Think about uh, today, right? We talk about large language models and, um, and, um, and um, well, even Photoshop, if some of you have already used the new version of Photoshop, right? If you download it, 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 it gives you the um, option to really pretty cool actually, right? Like to do what Morgan was showing us, but inside any sub rectangle of a picture. Uh, you can just select the sub right angle and, and then type in a textual description of what you want, how you want it to be filled in. And it works. It's pretty amazing. It's really, really amazing, actually. This is layer upon layer of interpretation going on. However, it's through text. I mean, you can also present some images, but the primary thing that people are using these days for mid-journey or, or this kind of um, tool is through textual description. Okay. Um, now, putting on my hat as a kind of a, as a visual instrument designer, uh, I could imagine, one can imagine a different um, way to assist the drawing of images, the creation of images, right? So you can take um, the brush itself, the, the, the cursor, right? And then you can just apply certain effects as you go like the memory tool in Photoshop, right? He has this idea, you can pick up a spot and then go somewhere else and start drawing. It'll remember the displacement and fill in with the bits from the displaced section. You know what I'm talking about, right? So there are many examples like that. Don't need to go through a text uh, interpretation. So, and that's a motor that becomes part, you can incorporate that into your motor skills for drawing. That's probably not the best tool for that example. But let's look at these different examples of habit. Um, I don't think it's in this section, but he also uses the example uh, elsewhere of sitting in the new car. Rather, you get used to driving a car, let's say a manual car with certain you know shifts, like gear, I don't know if you, you learn those of you who learned that. Um, and then going to a new car, an, another manual car, uh, manual transmission car, and that has may have a very different set uh, gearbox. You know, so you don't just go, I don't know, whatever. It's, you know, it's one, two, three, four, five. It might be in a different order. Um, and push a button. Yeah, you, you will, you will stop. You, you will stop. But it, you know, or, or no, sorry, the example is different. No, sorry. The example I think was you learn to drive a very particular kind of car with manual transmission, then you get rid of it, and you don't drive that kind of car for many, many years. And you've entirely forgotten even that you used to have that car, that kind of car. 
And then one day you come across that kind of car, you get inside and say, oh, I don't remember this car. But as you assume, you don't remember how to drive it, so to speak, until you sit down. And then when your body sits in the driver's seat and you put your hands out, oh, it's coming back to me. And then you start to move. Oh yeah, I, I know I know how this goes. It's that. So it's an example of muscle memory coming back. Okay, that was his example. It's a habit, not cognized. Um, see if there's another example from later on. This is around where he, I think we already referenced it, but the keyboard example, and that he says like you, can know how to type without knowing where every letter is on the keyboard. And so like, there's, okay, there's a keyboard right in front of me right now. I can type on it without looking, but if you said to me, where's the J? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like how no many, clue. Key, yeah, which row and which key, right? Which over, but yeah, yeah, I would. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's what he's saying, right? This uh, it's a section on what just after the dilating our being sentence that Cameron read, one can know how to type without knowing how to how to indicate where on the keyboard the letters that compose the words are located. Yeah, knowing how to type is not the same as knowing the location of each letter on the keyboard. And here it goes on. Nor even having acquired a conditioned reflex for each letter that is triggered upon seeing it. Now that's a bolder claim. That's a bolder claim worth thinking about. And then he says, sorry, go ahead. You were saying? I was gonna ask what what does he mean by that last part? Yeah, I, didn't that, that yeah. Sort of I can tell you. <clears throat> hey, please. So when you start, when you take, learn to keyboard type, uh, you start first you're doing the letters you're like you you're you're like you're reading the letters they're coming out um but after a while you just you just read the words and they they kind of kind of come out of your hands <laughs> like <laughs> that's how you that's how I, you can type really fast that way where you're not aware of the letters you're typing it's the words and it's it just kind of yeah. flows it's not letter by letter it's not letter mm -hmm, by not at all yeah, not letter by letter. That makes sense. I learned sign language. I mean, I've never, I was never very good at it, but I remember um, you learn, you know, to, to sign whole signs, but also letter by letter, you can spell. And then, you know, say B, C, right? D, da, da, da. And then people get really good at it. But I remember um, looking at people who are really good at finger spelling is that they signed words. They don't sign sets of letters. And I got stuck because I would keep signing letter by letter by letter. And it would be slow me down a lot. And I realized that that's what was making them go really fluidly because you're just signing the words. In fact, they would even go like this with the move with their hands so sort of like this, not just instead of just staying in one place. So that would give you the shape of the word as you're spelling letter by letter. So it's really amazing, actually. Um, things like that. Um, I, I, just, I just wanted to read the next next passage, uh, the, the beginning of the next paragraph. He says, if, but if habit <clears throat> is neither a form of knowledge nor an automatic reflex, then what is it? It is a question of a knowledge in our hands, which is only given through a bodily effort and cannot be translated by an objective designation. Right. So once again, right, I, I think we, they, we say muscle memory, it's a bit more evocative, but he says knowledge in our hands. Um, and, and this is key, only given through a bodily effort and cannot be transmitted by an objective definition. So let me ask then, okay, the typical, the basic thing, you know, if we have, um, you know, a prosthetic or something like this, um, in the limit case, we can imagine that it would be, you know, we could have a completely synthetic body. Um, well, I just use the word body, but we can have a synthetic a, a machine of some sort um, and would this machine have a bodied experience? What would it take, you know, to be able to say that this me mechanical thing has a has a bodily is is making bodily effort, you know? <laughs> I 
I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not sure. Um, I'm really not sure. I mean, you know, we have obviously, you know, prosthetics and amputees, et cetera, and they do perfectly fine. Um, I'm not sure. Um, the limit case is uh, some people like these extropians. I don't know if you heard of this cult uh, called the extropians, or they believe that they can, you can just, upload yourself. The idea is that they believe that the singularity is coming so that what we need to do is prepare ourselves to beam ourselves up into uh, this great computer is gonna come into the sky, to this, well, come and save us. And we're going to um, just beam all our consciousnesses into uh, the, the great computer. And, I just uh, read um, a book about that and I immediately donated it. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> which one? Oh, the singularity is near oh uh, okay. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's an article that may have occurred appeared also in eon magazine the same one where uh, i think rachel you found your link um i'll have to find it but uh, it was by a neuroscientist i think or neuroscientist slash philosopher <clears throat> who was making this argument um that if we were to, it's like Transcendence, the movie, right? Or any of these science fiction movies. <clears throat> if we were to uh, somehow map the, oh, even the statement is really weird, hard, uh, the, the kind of a snapshot of the brain state into a computer, um, we, there would no longer be consciousness, actually. No more conscious. And maybe another way to get to this is thinking about well, what I keep saying that a computer, digital computer, okay, not a quantum, but digital computer um, with a lot of electronics inside it is a very elaborate version of a bunch of sticks, you know, pivots and sticks, very elaborate. Um, so we can ask the question, is one pair of sticks, you know, with a pivot conscious? No, normally no. Two, three, four, you know? Just a very large number of sticks still. It's just a difference of degree, not in kind. <clears throat> um, that's a partial argument, but no, this is the I'm thinking. Um, because the other part of it is representation, is what do we mean when we say we map a brain state into a digital computer? Because that means we're um, taking, setting some numbers in a bunch of registers in a computer and then in the memory, <laughs> the digital memory. But what are we measuring in order to get those observations and put them into the machine? Yeah. So, and you know, and this this argument that one can make that the, an analog system has more, actually has infinite degrees of freedom, infinitely many degrees of freedom, and it's an indeterminate system, and so therefore there is no finite representation that can actually adequately um, represent the state of an analog system. So, uh, there's, there's more to it, more than that, but that's already uh, kind of a showstopper as far as I'm concerned. Well, so and, if, yeah. Yeah. well and, and, and at least with biological systems, there's like a, a nestedness of information storage <clears throat> right there's there's information stored at so many different levels and they're all and they and there's kind of like uh different methods of storing that information at each level i mean there's something you could map very i guess easily to a analog uh, a, a digital context which would be like dna base pairs but then there's information about the regulation of those dna ba base pairs and the expression of those and then there's like the information that's stored in like cellular components that then more like inter uh uh inter uh inter organ communication networks and then of course on, on the the body and then the brain and it's like so so there's all the there's nested hierarchies of information flows and regulation which just gets just 
it just is incomparable to anything digital. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is a great segue for next week. All right. I mean, I think we'll end early tonight. It's pretty tough slogging to get to the middle of Ponte, but this is an excellent um, set of topics to, to uh, finish on tonight. This question of, um, you know, biological systems and, and real messy neural, neural systems. Right? Um, even, well, the word system is complicated. It's not such a good word. But anyway, these layers and layers uh, as uh, metabolic systems, as Cameron is pointing out, so a couple of things that may be interesting to think about. One is um, this kind of, um, uh, when, we, when we go to a, from a micro to a macro uh, description, uh, inevitably we're going to be you know, uh, grouping together, let's say, bunches of smaller things like cells, let's say, you know, or, or molecules, right? And then we go into larger. But at, at each level, that means that we, we replace kind of the fine scale description, like where are all the molecules in a given cell or where, what is the state of each cell? You know, what, you know what, how many ion, what kind of ions are going in and out of the membrane of the cell? And what are its um, in, interior chemical processes, blah, 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 blah. And if we go to a higher level of description, we no longer account for those. <clears throat> We might look at other kinds of quantities, observables. If we go to a very high level, in case of a body, we might look at blood pressure, you know, or oxygen uptake, or blood flow. You might even look at the blood flow of a given artery, you know, the little device there. But certainly, we're not going to be observing the metabolic processes inside a cell. You know, it's certainly not inside molecule by molecule, things like that. We can, but we don't. You know, that's a different level of description. Um, so Norbert Wiener had a very nice uh, way to characterize this a consequence of these kinds of loss of information when you coarse grain to go from micro to macro to higher level. He said, you know, in statistical physics, um, you know, we have this fine grain description of little particles that move around with little vectors, right? Momentum and mass for each molecule. Um, but then when we go to the macro description, like the air molecules in a room, we have only temperature <laughs> or maybe a little bit of air pressure, but this is just like one number or two numbers, right? Which account for um, Avogadro number, uh, trillions and trillions and trillions of particles. So this number does not at all have any information about the momenta and uh, positions of these air molecules. And he said, however, um, you know, and this is always going to be a problem. So if you think about statistical physics from the point of view of a, um, uh, of a little bacterium that's being shoved and bounced around by all these little molecules, right? Uh, temperature, global temperature, room temperature and pressure mean nothing to this bacterium, you know, because it's actually feeling the impacts of all these little molecules, bounding in motion, molecules bouncing off it, right? And to it, the world is very viscous and very, very jerky and jaggy. It's being jerked and bounced around all the time by these little molecules here and there. So uh, coarse graining really doesn't, is not adequate. Um, just give us this kind of, nothing can really, this, this is a kind of multi-scale, multi-scale phenomena. So it's, yeah, next time we, we talk, um, we meet, when we meet in person, uh, I propose that we look at this Aeon article by uh, some neuroscience philosophy guy who kind of have laid out a very um, cogent article argument that the brain, our brains are nothing like uh, computers. Um, and we don't think like that. Um, and then the other is uh, some, I think the other article I, I put in my email uh, you can skim, you don't need to read because it's a very technical article, but it's, a, it's probably one of the most important articles published in history of computer science. It's by Claude Shannon. Uh, it's called, I think that's the one, uh, A Mathematical Theory of Communication. And at least you could have it in your toolbox so you just can say, hey, I, I, I know about this article because the beginning of computer science, there were two things. One was this article for how to re represent any signal digitally. Uh, and, and to find the bit, to find information. So, oh, to find entropy. So it was the article that started it. It was called the digital. 
Uh, and the other uh, was the work by Turing, which I don't refer to, but this work, I mean, it's in the, it's in the supplementary part. And I will email you a few other things uh, to, to look at along the way, like um, maybe there's a piece I can share about uh, data science. But anyway, next week I'll be, I'll, I'll say a few words about um, like AI and machine learning, that kind of stuff. Okay, be a rant. <laughs> okay. So it'll be my turn to present some stuff. Any last questions or comments for the middle punty? Okay. Well, okay, I applaud the people who presented today. All right, hey, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Morgan, did a really great job. Great job, okay? So I'll see you all in person next week. Thank you. Thank Good night, you. guys. Good night, take care, bye, take care. All right. <laughs>